Welcome, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers and to thank Ojoli for giving me the opportunity to uh, give this talk about the Wilmore energy, its critical points, the Wilmore emissions, and a property of those Wilmore emissions, that compactness, or lack thereof, we will see exactly what I mean. The first section of this talk, so the first video, uh, we, we talk about the Wilmore energy and the zoology of the Wilmore surfaces. So, the point will be to give you the definitions, to introduce the terms, the quantity I'm going to use, and to try to give you a feel of what happens when we're studying this object, to try to give you a feel of the variety and all the array of uh, cases we have to consider. So it will be a bit lighter in mathematical details, but I hope it will make it up uh, by, being, uh, by giving you uh, an intuition on this object. So let's start by defining our object. The first one is the notion of uh, an immersion of a Riemann surface into R3. So in essence, we're simply considering a surface in R3 and its parameterization. For now, the parameterization is an immersion. This will have to be kind of relaxed a bit later. Locally, we can define the uh, directional derivative and assemble them to the gradient, which spans the tangent plane. This tangent plane as a plane in R3 is entirely defined by its Gauss map, by its unit normal, which we call the Gauss map, also the normal of the surface. What's interesting about this Gauss map is that the variation of this single vector would describe the variation of the whole tangent plane. And the variation of the tangent plane, in fact, describes the local shape of the surface. So these variations will be the curvatures, and this is why they have a geometric importance. Classically, we introduce the second fundamental form A, which contains all the variations of the Gauss map, and that's the tangent plane. But to make it simpler to manage, we define scalar quantities, like the Gauss curvature, which is the determinant, and the mean curvature, which is the, which is the half truth. So the first quantity is important because of its role uh, as a topological invariant, with the gauss bonnet theorem. The second quantity is important because it describes the first variation of the area function. Another important quantity is a trace-free second fundamental form. And it's in fact, well, the trace-free parts of A. And in fact, A0 and HG form a trace-free, trace-full decomposition of A. Why is this A0 important? What does it describe exactly? So without going into too much, too many details, uh, I would like to, to uh, point, to, point out to you that for a round sphere, a Euclidean sphere, A0 is equal to zero because the round sphere is umbilical. So in fact, uh, what A0 will measure is the difference between the principal curvatures. And it will tell you how close to an umbilical surface is your, uh, your surface lo uh, is locally. So how far from a round sphere, a Euclidean sphere, how far from the profile of a round sphere, your surface is local. So this is the intuition behind the A0. For us, this curvature will be a starting point to define energies. The first energy is the Wilmore energy, so the integral of the h squared. So all the energy I'm going to consider will look like this one. There will be quadratic energy in the curvature. So this is the first energy, the Wilmore energy, integral of h squared. Similarly, we can define the total trace-free trace total curvature, which is the integral of a naught squared. Uh, if a naught denoted uh, how far you were locally from being a round sphere, e naught can be seen as a measure of how far you are from the Euclidean sphere global. Assembling W and E0, we can obtain the total curvature. And when we say that we can obtain this E as an assemble, an assemble um, of E0 and W, well, it's because since A0 and H form a trace-free traceful decomposition of A, well, E is obtained as E0 plus 2W. So in fact, it's better to focus on W and E0 and not look at E because it will be studied uh, as a consequence. The thing is, those two energy are almost equivalent. If you do the computations, you can see that E0 and 2W differ by this term, the integral of the Gauss curvature. And this term is a topological invariant thanks to Gauss Bonnet theorem. So once the topology is fixed, the behavior of E0 and W is going to be exactly the same. So those two energies are almost equivalent. And this all, in this almost, there is the caveat when the topology is fixed, and we will see in a, bit, uh, in, in a bit later why this is very important. But first, let's consider what the reason for studying W, the reason for studying E0. 
For the first reason is historical. It was introduced by Sophie Germain as a measure of the elastic behavior of a metallic plate. So in an engineering situation, if you have a surface which has an elastic behavior, you will have to study something which is close to W and, we, and this will more energy will thus be relevant in this case. Similarly, to, to explain the characteristic biconcave shape of a red blood cell, uh, this energy was introduced. And in fact, it modelizes, uh, I think it was a B lipid layer uh, for uh, the membrane of a cell. And you can recognize the leading order term as H minus alpha squared, the Wilmore energy, plus a perturbation, of course. Similarly, although in a bit of a wider context than what I'm considering, when I'm only considering surfaces in R3, there is the Hawking mass whose leading, whose uh, important term is the Wilmore energy there. Another case is since E0 measures the distance from the Euclidean sphere, it's a prime measure of the quality of an inversion of the sphere. So without going into too many details, if I look at the Euclidean sphere, there are two, uh, two orientations with inward pointing normal or outward pointing normal. And we know that there is um, a path linking these two uh, orientations. This, was, this, this is what we call an inversion of the sphere. And an inversion of high quality will be an inversion such that um, the, the path takes us not far away from the Euclidean surface, the, the Euclidean sphere, sorry. And thus, it will be a path whose maxima, maximum for the E0 will be minimal. The optimal inversion of the sphere would thus solve a min-max problem for E0. So I gave you four reasons to uh, have an interest into uh, W or E0. And uh, well, uh, the, for me, um, a fifth reason will be more important, and it will be the conformal properties of W and E0. So the conformal group, it's a group of different morphisms of R3, which simply multiply the metric. For us, it would be enough to take a simplified definition, which is in fact the Newbill theorem, and which states that the conformal group is a group of different morphisms spanned by translations, rotations, dilations, and inversions. I think I only need to detail the last family and an inversion centered at P sends X to X minus P over X minus P squared. It is highly peculiar in that, well, P is sent to infinity. In fact, if you look at the inversion centered at zero, it exchanges zero at infinity. So an inversion will be a non-compact transformation. So in practice, it will, this non-compact transformation will turn a non-compact surface into a compact surface, and it can do the reverse. For instance, let's consider a plane. It's non-compact. It's not a compact surface. But if I take an inversion from a point centered away from, this, from the plane, then it will become a round sphere, a Euclidean sphere. Conversely, if I take a sphere and a point on the sphere, then taking the inversion at this point will open my sphere into a plane. So the inversion will turn a non-compact surface into a compact surface and vice versa. What's interesting to look at is that in both those cases, the uh, E0 does not change. A plane is flat, so E0 is equal to 0. A sphere is umbilical, so E0 is equal to 0. However, the Wilmore energy changes. A plane is flat, W is equal to 0. The sphere has Wilmore energy, 4 pi. So, well, how is it possible since I told you that E0 and W have the same behavior? Well, it's because of the caveat big, uh, when the topology does not change. And the inversion changed a compact surface into a non-compact one. So it changes the topology of the surface. So this is where this caveat is important because thanks to an inversion, the topology changes. And in fact, this behavior is seen even further in that E0 is a conformal invariant. So we can compute the variation of E0 under the action of translations, dilations, rotations, and inversion, and it's always stays invariant. In fact, it's A0 squared times the volume element, which is a pointwise invariant, so it's even better than this. And thus, looking at the formula linking E0 and W, we know that W is a conformal invariant as long as the topology is not changed, as long as, well, the topological term does not change. And so this means that it's a, it's a conformal invariant as long as the inversion, if the inversion does not change the topology of the surface. 
So it's uh, almost a conformal invariant. But for us, we're going to look at critical points of W. And since when we're looking at a small perturbation, we will not change the topology, critical points of W are also critical points of E0. And thus, since E0 is a conformal invariant, this set is stable under the conformal transformation. So the conformal transformation of a critical point is going to be a critical point, perhaps at a different energy level for W. That is true, but it's still going to be a critical point. And this, the, these critical points are called Wilmore surfaces, and they are what I'm going to study from now on. First, let us try to understand uh, what we're going to look into. Let's, let us try to have a zoology of Wilmore surfaces. What kind of examples can we find for Wilmore surfaces? Well, the first one, we're looking at critical points for energy. Let's look at the minimizers. So we, want, we, we prefer to have compact uh, examples of, uh, of uh, Wilmore surfaces. So the first compact example is the Fux minimizer, which was formed by Wilmer, and, and it is the round sphere, the Euclidean sphere. It's a Wilmer embedded surface, and its Wilmer energy is 4 pi. But I can also look at local minimizers or minimizers in the uh, look in the, in the topological class, look, uh, minimizers in the genus class. And for the tori, it's the Wilmore torus, which is a Wilmore embedded surface of energy, 2 pi squared. The thing is, Wilmore uh, showed that the round sphere is, uh, is the minimal uh, surface, uh, the compact of minimal energy for compact surfaces. And he conjectured that the Wilmore torus was at the minimum for, at the minimum energy for the tori. But the proof was only proved recently by Marquez and Neves. And in fact, for genus bigger than two, we don't even have uh, an, out an outstanding ex um, candidate. So we are not likely to find uh, examples uh, of genus greater than two looking at minimizers even in their, in their own uh, topological class. However, there is a family of examples, which is the minimal surfaces family, so for, for whom h is equal to zero everywhere, so for whom w is equal to zero, which gives us a family of examples of Wilmore surfaces, but they are not going to be compact. However, I told you that the inversion of a non-compact surface was a compact surface, and the inversion of a Wilmore surface was a Wilmore surface. So the inversion of minimal surfaces will give us compact Wilmore surfaces. However, in order to study them, we, we, we need to study the non-compact behavior because it's going to have an influence on the compact, on the behavior of the, of the inverse compact Wilmore surfaces. So to do that, let us introduce the notion of an end. So a catenoid end uh, happens when nabla phi behaves as x minus p to the power minus one. So in fact, phi behaves as some logarithm around p. This is what we call a catenoid end because it has the profile of a catenoid. If x minus p behaves as some theta with theta an integer smaller than minus one, we say that p is a planar n of multiplicity, absolute value of theta plus one. And in fact, we say that it is branched if the absolute value of theta plus one is strictly bigger than one. For, ex for example, an example is going to make things clear. If I want a branch n of multiplicity two, I need nabla phi to behave as some r to the power of minus three. And thus, phi is going to behave as r to the power of minus two. So I'm going to have two sheets going at infinity. If I can look in a see-through manner, you can truly see the two sheets, and we can identify the multiplicity of the branch n as a winding order at infinity. OK, so this will describe the non-compact behavior that we will have to consider as ends, either catenoid, simple planar ends, or branched n. OK, let's look at the first example. So, the catenoid, it's, with this formulation, it's a minimal sphere with two ends, two catenoid ends. If I take the inversion, I have a compact Wilmore sphere of Wilmore energy, A pi. But the thing is, uh, this inversion, this inverted catenoid will be singular. If I look, it, if, if, if I look at it in see-through manner, I can see that this profile is not going to be regular. It's going to be C0, but not C1. And this is, in fact, a consequence of uh, the, uh, the profile of a catenoid end. 
because the uh, catenoid n has a profile as a logarithm, when I take the inversion, the logarithm is also be found, going to be found in the inverted surface. There's going to be a power in front of it, which will make sure that it's going to be at least continuous, but it's not going to be smooth. So this is why I will avoid catenoids from now on. I will avoid catenoidal ends. I try to find only planar ends. Okay, so classically in the, in the classification of uh, Wilmot surfaces, after the catenoid comes the Ennepe Weierstrass surface. So the Ennepe surface, it's a minimal sphere with one end of multiplicity three. We can see here the three sheets going at infinity. And when I take an inversion, I obtain Wilmot sphere of energy 12 pi, except it's not going to be immersed. Why? Because I have three sheets which are intertwined and going at infinity. And when I take the inversion, I'm going to have one point with three singular sheets going through it. It's going to be a singular point. It's not going to be immersed. Another way to look at it is that around the end, well, uh, the inner surface will behave as some Artin power minus three. And if I take the inversion, the inner surface will be the inverted inner surface will be will behave as some R to the power three. So nabla, nabla phi is going to behave as some R squared. So it's not going to be an immersion. Nabla phi will cancel out at this point. So this is what I said at the beginning. We will need to kind of relax the condition of immersion in order to consider these kind of examples. And to relax those, we're going to introduce branch points. So a branch point is a point around which nabla phi behaves some x minus p to the power theta, with theta strictly positive. We say that is a branch point of multi multiplicity theta plus one. And it's exactly the inversion of an n. For instance, here to look at a branch point of multiplicity three, nabla phi behaves as some r squared and phi behaves as some r cubed. So at this point, in the see-through manner, it's clear. You can see that I have three sheets which are intertwined around this point. And once more, the multiplicity of the branch point can be seen as a winding order around this branch point. So with this vocabulary, we can look at the inner surface again and say that its inverse is a branch Wilmot sphere with a branch point of multiplicity three, which comes from the inversion of the branch end of multiplicity three. Another example with some topology this time. So the chain gags at a surface. So it's a minimal surface of arbitrary genius with one end of multiplicity three. In fact, it's the inner surface with the right number of holes punched through in order to have the right genus. So you can see genus one, Genus three, and you have the same uh, end of multiplicity three, uh, which in fact is uh, asymptotic to n. When I take the inversion, I have Wilmot surfaces of energy twelve pi, of genus G, and with a branch point of multiplicity three, which once more come from the inversion of the branch end. And this is in fact the only picture I did not make myself, and I took it from the Scientific Graphic Project website, which I invite you to go visit because they have a, a, a lot of illustrations and they are very nicely done. Okay, so so far I've shown you a singular case, the catenoid, and two immersed, uh, two a branch case with uh, variety in the genus. But do I only have a branch case? Can I not find a immersed minimal surface? Well, of course we can. Uh, and it is, in fact, the Bryan surface, which is a, a family of immersed spheres, minimal, with four simple planar ends. So this means that there are four sheets going at infinity. So uh, here, I think we can see them. There's one which is in the plane of the screen there, one which is orthogonal to the plane of the screen, but which is vertical, so this one there, and two which are horizontal, this one and this one. So four sheets going to infinity. But these four sheets correspond to four different uh, ends of multiplicity one. So four regular ends. And this means that when I take an inversion, I'm going to obtain an immersed Wilmot sphere of energy 16 pi with a regular point of density four. This means that I'm going to have one point, which is going to be uh, crossed by four sheets. But these four sheets will correspond to four different points on the parameterization. This will be for regular sheets. And to better understand this, understand this, it's interesting to compare and contrast with the mixed case of the low pass surface. The low pass surface uh, goes to infinity in four directions, but this time with a branch point, branch end of multiplicity three, this one, one, two, and three, and a simple planar end of multiplicity one, this one there. 
So when I take the inversion, I have a branch will mosphere sphere, energy still 16 pi, with a point of density four. So crossed by four sheets. But this time, when we try to split it, we're going to obtain one branch point of multiplicity three. So three sheets which are intertwined and that we cannot uh, unknot, and one simple uh, sheet which comes from a regular point of uh, multiplicity one. So the comparison between uh, those two cases, I think, uh, shows you uh, uh, what kind of mixing and matching you can do between branch point and simple points, and how wide an array of solution of uh, Wilmore surfaces you will have. So this concludes uh, the first part of this talk. I hope I, uh, I, I gave you a feel of uh, what Wilmore surfaces are and what kind of examples we could have. I focus mainly uh, for the benefit of uh, the, the second part on uh, minimal surfaces and the inverses. But in fact, Wilmore surfaces contain minimal surfaces and the inversions strictly. So that we have examples of Wilmore surfaces which are not conformal transformation of minimal surfaces in R3. So to sum up, uh, Wilmore surfaces are going to be a problem which contains strictly minimal surfaces. So with all the variety of minimal surfaces and uh, with interesting conformal invariance property, which are already meaningful. And I'm in, a, in the next se section, in the next video, I'm going to study the analytic behavior. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video.